Welcome everyone for our targeted protein uh, degradation webinar series. First, I would like to remind you that uh, that in 16th, 16th this December, we will have our trainee short talks, uh, which to which you can send an abstract uh, for in, in the upcoming two, two, two weeks. For more, more details, please, please visit our, 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 our website. Today is my greatest pleasure to, to introduce uh, uh, Michal Rappe. Michal uh, received his uh, PhD at Max Planck Institute uh, of Biochemistry, and he performed the postdoctoral uh, work in Mark Kishner lab at Harvard Medical School. Michal joined the Department of Molecular and Cell Biology at the University of California at Berkeley, where he is currently a chair of cancer biology uh, and a professor of cell, bi cell and, and development uh, biology. Uh, Michal is also an investigator of Ho Howard Hughes Medical Institute. His work was recognized by multiple awards, including NIH Director's uh, New Innovators Award, the, the, the Vilsec Prize, and the National uh, Blavatnik uh, Award in, in Life Science. Uh, Michal Rappe is, is a pioneer in uncovering molecular mechanisms uh, of cell fate, determination using post-translational modification with ubiquitin as a, as a starting point. Uh, Michal's, Michal's work uh, revealed essential ubiquitin signals, substrate and, uh, and enzymes, as, as well as mechanisms of ubiquitin, ubiquitin, ubiquitin uh, and are essential for, for human development and disease. Uh, um, to, to advance new ubiquitin focused uh, approaches in drug discovery, Michal uh, co founded the Nurix uh, Therapeutics uh, and support. Uh, uh, with support from the, from the Column Group, uh, and I'm sure today Miha will uh, will talk out, uh, will tell us fascinating uh, stories, which would include uh, the zinc as a as a, as a molecular glue. So, uh, very thank you very much for accepting our invitation, and uh, we are very much looking forward to your seminar. So, so thank you for for the invitation. It's really fun that we have. Um, the ability now to connect throughout the world with Zoom. Uh, this is nice, even though I complained that I didn't get a chance to visit Boston, which is one of my favorite cities of all since my postdoc time. So I would like to talk today about um, a very new pathway that we recently discovered that we think is important. It controls um, mitochondrial activity during development and in disease. And uh, we believe it offers many opportunities for uh, induced protein degradation. And so this work uh, started in my lab um, roughly five or six years ago, when we became interested in um, the very trivial or naive question even, um, why development is so robust. So every one of you um, consists of about 37 or so trillion cells, and they fall into 200 or more different cell types. And these cell types have to be like produced at the right time in the right place during uh, development. And even though this seems like an incredibly complicated task, um, it actually works out many times, roughly 400,000 times every single day. Um, and um, you know what I also found striking was the fact that this works out not only when everything is lined up, but also when um, moms that are pregnant um, you know, face serious challenges. And this picture is from sort of the time and the place where I was growing up. This was a place in Germany called uh, Bavarian Siberia, and it got its <laughs> nicknamed Bavarian Siberia, and it got its, its name from um, the environmental pollution we were facing um, at this time. And so my mom was definitely exposed to many toxins uh, in the environment, yet she gave birth to somebody who has two arms, two legs, and can talk to you today. And so one reason for why development is so robust, even in the face of these challenges, is that um, evolution has uh, come up with many signaling pathways that we call stress responses that use sensory arms that can detect difficult situations such as metabolic stress or temperature stress or exposure to chemicals and then set in motion an effector arm that basically counteracts these difficult situations to maintain organismal homeostasis. So these stress responses had originally been uh, described mostly in the context of protein misfolding through really groundbreaking work by Art Horwich or, or Uli Hartl. And their misfunction has been shown to cause diseases of old age, such as neurodegeneration. But um, in the last few years, we realized that stress responses also play a very important function early in development in tissue formation, but the underlying mechanisms are really very poorly understood. 
a common feature of uh, stress responses is, you know, our favorite post-translational modification, ubiquitization. And I don't think that I need to introduce this um, modification to this audience here, but just to highlight a few hallmarks of it. Ubiquitization is, is brought uh, into place by very specific enzymes called E3 ligases. And we have roughly 600 E3 ligases encoded in our genome that bind substrates through very uh, defined sequence uh, elements or structural motifs that we call degrons. And the interaction between substrate and E3 ligase causes ubiquitization, which is then read out by um, hundreds of effector proteins. And one of the cool things of this modification is that dependent on this effector um, and, and the type of ubiquitin chain you have, you can elicit different outcomes, something that we described as the ubiquitin code. And so most importantly for today, um, and most importantly for what many of you are doing in your daily lives, ubiquitilation can induce protein degradation either through the proteasome or through autophagy. But it's also possible to change protein interaction, something that's particularly important in DNA damage stress pathways uh, or change protein localization, such as in response to metabolic stresses uh, when endocytosis plays a, a, a very important role. Now, um, my lab has, uh, as Mikolai mentioned, studied ubiquitin for a very, very long time. And so we figured we could use our knowledge um, of ubiquitin and, and the enzymatic machinery of it to address the question of how stress responses guide development. But when we were starting to do these experiments, uh, we realized very soon that um, development is a unique circumstance and embryo really faces many challenging conditions during development and so has evolved a, a very large number of signaling systems to counteract those. And so by studying development, actually we feel like being in a, in a, in a candy store to discover new stress responses. And this in the last years has been sort of a major driver in my lab where we um, used uh, studies of development to find new stress responses. And then of course, study their mechanism to, to learn how they work. And this is really uh, the center of the talk today. So all of this started um, when a fantastic uh, postdoc in the lab, Richard Yao, who now works at Lysia, so is still in the protein degradation space, and followed up on a discovery we, we made um, uh, in the context of this ubiquitin code idea, namely that we discovered um, functions for these uh, conjugates called branched ubiquitin chains. And together with um, Vishwa Dixit at Chenentech, Richard developed uh, antibodies, bispecific antibodies to detect these branch chains. And this allowed him to find that they play a very important role in protein quality control. Specifically, they were marking um, nascent polypeptides that came off the ribosome and could not fold. And so they were very um, prone to aggregation. This modification with branch chains recruited and disaggregates called P97BCP, which could drill you know, the modified protein out of these very strong protein interactions in emerging aggregates and sent them for degradation by the proteasome. This is something that we know is very important for uh, preventing aggregation during neurodegeneration, for example, and we are very actively following this up right now to develop new tools to target neurodegeneration. Um, but um, soon after this discovery, we realized that this basic quality control pathway actually plays an important role in uh, development. And this was work by um, Eugene O, oh, a fantastic postdoc at the time. Eugene is now in your neighborhood. He's assistant professor at, at the MGH and at Harvard. And if you need somebody to um, talk about um, ubiquitin dependent control of gene expression, I would really encourage you to like, seek out Eugene, who's, who's just brilliant. And he was um, teamed up or he teamed up uh, and formed a fantastic team with uh, another postdoc in, in the lab, Kevin, who is now um, on the job market this year. And they actually had done an experiment uh, that was, we thought, completely unrelated, namely that they wanted to understand how stem cells maintain their pluripotent character. And they had done unbiased uh, genetic screens focused on the ubiquitin pathway. And the hits of the screen, it doesn't really matter what the uh, details are, but the hits of the screen were exactly the enzymes um, and effectors that we had found in our um, uh, quality control pathway I mentioned before. It was the E3 ligase, the chaperones, the proteasome, and the P97 um, segregase, all, all finding there, suggesting that a quality control pathway also plays an important role in uh, development and uh, most importantly in stem cell pluripotency. And um, because this has been published a while back, I just uh, uh, summarized this, what Kevin and Eugene could then find was that, that actually um, an enzyme called the NFH promoting complex assembles these branch chains, does so in mitosis, 
assembles these chains at very specific locations on the chromosome, um, where uh, namely the transcription start sites of specific genes that need to be reactivated after the stem cell exits mitosis. And just as um, the signal acts in quality control, it recruits this P97 disaggregate to extract a very strong uh, complex, namely the nucleosome from, from these sites, sending um, histones for degradation, clearing up the site so that stem cells could, could maintain their pluripotent character. So what this told us was that, that a particular signal that uh, was needed for quality control, these branched ubiquitin chains, is also used in a developmental context for controlling gene expression. Um, and another um, kind of uh, flavor of, of this kind of research um, uh, was started um, uh, a few years earlier and led to a, a different paradigm of quality control that we could you know, find out by studying development. That was work initially started by Achim Werner, who's now um, at NIH and now taken over by Regina Bauer. And what, what they had found was that um, there were enzymes, in particular ubiquitin ligases, that were important for um, certain developmental um, decisions, in this case, for making a particular cell type called the neural crest. Um, when we studied the mechanism that is underlying here, we could figure out what the substrates were and how they have to be ubiquitinated. But the key uh, feature here was that the E3 ligase, which was a column three based enzyme, needed to be in a homodimeric form in order to recognize the Degron sequences on the substrate. In fact, these substrates are unique in that they have 12 recognition motifs for the E3 ligase, and you need about seven of them to recognize the substrate by the enzyme, a feature called allovalency. But when we studied these uh, enzymes in, uh, and their formation in cells, we recognized that more often than not, they would actually form heterodimers, which would be inactive and would not be able to uh, bind and, and take over the substrate. And this was sort of the entry for, for a brilliant graduate student in the lab, Elijah Mina. He's now also in Boston. Everybody seems to go to Boston these days. Um, he's a postdoc in, in Steve Elich's lab. And if you ever want to know how to reconstitute an almost impossible reaction, I would uh, encourage you to seek out Elijah and, and talk to him. He's the master of that. With his knowledge, he found that, that actually the cells contained uh, ubiquitination enzymes again. Um, uh, in this case, it was an SCF type ligase. It doesn't really matter what its name is. They recognized these inactive heterodimers of these E3 ligases we had found to be important for neural crest specification. It could both dismantle the heterodimer and degrade the heterodimer, thereby ensuring that cells uh, would maintain um, only the right complexes. So we call this quality control of complex composition, or because this is um, for dimers, we called it dimerization quality control. And that again turned out to be really important for development for actually both the peripheral nervous system, including the neural crest, but also the central nervous system. I just want to show you one little tidbit of this um, that can be seen in a developing Xenopus embryo, um, which um, is a system that you can obviously touch. And when you touch an embryo, it, it wiggles because it senses the touch through its uh, mechanosensory uh, neurons. But when you, um, we can leave this going, but when you actually um, touch mutants that lack this quality control pathway, we found that they lack the neurons that are needed for mechanosensation. Um, and so you can touch them and you don't elicit a response. Again, underscoring how quality control plays a very important role in development. And in this case, it really showed us that there are systems in place um, that allow cells or the developing um, embryo to safeguard complex composition. Now, the third example, um, I told you we are in a candy store here um, that, that uh, came out very, uh, very recently through the same kind of work is, is really what I wanna talk for most of the time today. And that's uh, the reductive stress response, a quality control pathway really monitoring mitochondrial activity. And I should mention that this is really the brainchild and work of um, Andrew Manford, the postdoc in the lab. Andrew is not only a brilliant scientist, but also a fantastic mentor. He led um, a very diverse team of undergrads, graduate students and, and collaborators through this work. Um, for most of what I talk about today, he again, collaborated with Elisha, in this case, for the structural work. And in the initial part, he uh, worked with Fernando Rodriguez Perez, a grad student who now works for Vishwa Dixit. Um, yeah, so when Andrew came, his key question was the question that I had posed in the beginning. Can we use development to discover stress signaling pathways? And for that, he needed a developmental pathway that would respond to stress. And he very quickly zoomed into myogenesis, the process by which you turn a mononucleate muscle stem cell or satellite cell into a multinucleate myotube. 
And so I hope that all of you live very healthy lives and you will um, go to the gym or now post pandemic run outside um, a lot. And if you do this, you, you actually uh, impose stress on this uh, my, uh, myoblast or, or satellite cell population. And if you do it correctly, hopefully by the end of the day, you will have induced this differentiation program and you will end up with a few more myofibers. If, however, you, you don't live healthy lives and you eat very badly or very, very little, or you have um, underlying uh, conditions, um, nutritional stress can actually have the opposite effect and interfere with this, with this pathway. So um, this is a stress pathway um, that clearly responds to de uh, a developmental pathway that clearly responds to stress. And so it was sort of a, a perfect starting point for finding new stress responses. And so, um, because Andrew um, uh, knew that stress signaling often requires ubiquitination, and, and I assume also because he was in our lab, um, he decided to focus in and try and find um, E3 ligases that are important for uh, myoblast differentiation. And for uh, that, he built a really powerful image platform, image-based screening platform that we now use um, on a very regular basis. And when he depleted E3 ligases, he very quickly found that depletion of some E3 ligases really effectively turned off myogenesis. And it validated immediately our approach because the top hit was a gene called KEEP1, which is sort of the master regulator of the oxidative stress response. And just to um, show you the strength um, of these phenotypes that Andrew saw, um, in green here are myotubes that we can generate in vitro. And as you can see, if we lack this regulator of the oxidative stress response, we do not form any of these myotubes, suggesting that this is really a very important regulator of, of myoblast differentiation. Now, KEEP1 is actually a very important protein. It's a substrate specificity factor of a cullin 3 based E3 ligase. It's a tumor suppressor and, and is um, uh, mutated in roughly 40% uh, of cases of lung adenocarcinoma, for example. Um, and what its normal function is as a, mem as, a, as a core component of the oxidative stress response is that it limits transcription of NRF2. So if you inhibit KEEP1, you would assume to get more of this transcription factor NRF2. And we knew that this accumulation of NRF2 was responsible for this developmental phenotype because we could rescue it by co-depleting NRF2 together with KEEP1. Now, NRF2 is an antioxidant transcription factor, which drives um, the expression of many antioxidant proteins, including those that produce glutathione. And quite strikingly, I, I believe, we could also rescue um, this uh, KEEP1 phenotype by co-depleting enzymes important for glutathione production. And so what this told us was that it is um, the premature scavenging of reactive oxygen species or persistent antioxidant signaling, basically, that would prevent myogenesis. Most of the um, reactive oxygen species that are produced in cells are actually produced by um, the mitochondrial electron transport chain. And there are scavengers that specifically um, remove uh, these uh, reactive oxygen species that are produced by either complex one or complex three of um, the uh, electron transport chain. And just you know, supporting our keep one depletion data, if we would eliminate these reactive oxygen species produced by mitochondria, we would also interfere with myogenesis very profoundly. And so what all of these experiments um, told us was that it's really the absence of reactive oxygen species that interfered with myogenesis. And that's a condition uh, referred to as reductive stress. So reductive stress is kind of the uh, neglected sibling of the oxidative stress response or oxidative stress. Oxidative stress, you know, very well characterized. It's the condition where cells experience too many reactive oxygen species, and that can damage your DNA, proteins, lipids, and so forth, and has many difficult uh, consequences for an organism. Reductive stress was actually discovered, recognized uh, already in the 1980s. And it's kind of the opposite, that you lack uh, these reactive oxygen species. And um, from, from this early work, it was uh, assumed and, and, and shown later that these reactive oxygen species at their physiological levels actually perform very important signaling functions. They are still not 100% worked out, but, but it's clear that signaling through reactive oxygen species is important for development. So if you lose them, you interfere with the signaling. Um, this is a condition that is actually encountered by an organism very frequently. You not only see it when you do when you get persistent antioxidant signaling by artificially depleting, uh, you know, an antioxidant uh, the keep one protein, 
but you also experience, for example, when you inhibit the electron transport chain, which, as I said, is the major source for reactive oxygen species. You uh, encounter this upon um, protein aggregation or uh, when you have aberrant metabolism, especially um, with problems during glycolysis. And if you don't mitigate this condition, um, again, the consequences are rather dire. You end up with diseases ranging from cancer, cardiomyopathy, or diabetes. And so because uh, none of us succumbed to these diseases when we were like one year old, um, cells must have mechanisms to detect reductive stress and alleviate this. So there has to be a reductive stress response, but what that would be, how it would work, and so forth, that was unknown. So Andrew uh, realized that he had at his disposal actually an experimental system that should allow him to discover the reductive stress response quite simply. And so he simply hypothesized that it was not the absence of reactive oxygen species that would interfere with myogenesis, but that the cells would detect that they have run out of um, reactive uh, oxygen species and then actively tell myoblasts that it's not a good time um, uh, to, to differentiate so that there would be a reductive stress response that would actually be responsible for this developmental decision. And if this is the case, then you can design very straightforward genetic modifier screens to find the components of the reductive stress response. Namely, you should just look for proteins that when depleted, allow differentiation to occur during reductive stress or in cells where we had depleted this keep one protein. So we did this uh, genetic modifier screen and it gave us one hit, which always simplifies things quite a bit. And that hit was um, very strong. It was an E3 Liga subunit again called FEMON-B. Um, and just to show you uh, um, how robust this works and how, how great this, this approach actually worked out, um, as I showed you before, if we depleted KEEP1 and imposed reductive stress, we do not get any myotubes and myogenesis was really blocked. This is the quantification. If you uh, deplete FEMON-B, this uh, uh, modifier, you get actually the opposite phenotype. You consistently get more myotubes in your in your in vitro differentiation system. But if you co-deplete them with each other, you actually rescue both phenotypes quantitatively, telling you right away they would be at opposing um, ends of the spectrum. One might be uh, the oxidative stress regulator and then the other should be the reductive stress regulator. The same holds true with um, the experiment where we depleted reactive oxygen species produced by um, the mitochondrial electron transport chain using scavenger molecules. Um, again, we see that we don't have differentiation in the absence of these reactive oxygen species, but we can rescue this if we deplete FEMON-B under these conditions. So FEMON-B um, is a, a substrate specificity factor um, of a so-called Cullen 2 based uh, E3 ligase. This is the family of E3 ligases that you should all know very well because their architecture has really to a large part be revealed by beautiful work from Bill Kaling's lab um, on the VHL um, E3 ligase. Femon B binds to Cullen 2 scaffolds through this Elongin BC heterodimer, and the active site is here within the ring domain RBX1, which then recruits an E2 to polyubiquitylate the substrate. And these Cal2 ligases typically um, induce substrate degradation, suggesting that accumulation of a protein um, would, would account, uh, account for Femon B phenotypes. And I spare you the data um, uh, or the experiments we, we use to identify the substrate, uh, mostly through proteomics. Um, but we found that the key substrate in all of these pathways was a protein called FNP1 that was rapidly polyubiquitylated by FEMON-B and degraded by FEMON-B. Now, in order to monitor this degradation, that's really important for us these days, uh, to monitor it quantitatively so that we can uh, detect changes in activity of this pathway, um, we developed a facts-based assay um, that is based to a large extent on uh, Steve Alich's GPS work, where we fuse a substrate uh, or a specific sequence of the substrate, such as this Dagron uh, to GFP, and then co-express it with a normalization protein. And so the ratio of GFP to M-cherry can, can tell you the stability of this this protein. And this showed us, using this approach, we, we could show that FNP1 really is the target. We see that it is uh, degraded when we induce uh, FEMON-B. This is indicated by this left shift from the green to the red curve. And nicely enough, we also know that this is a specific reaction because if we use a substrate binding deficient mutant or a catalytic mutant of the C3 ligase, we do not see this shift. Conversely, if we use CRISPR-Cas9 to delete FEMON-B, we see the shift in the opposite direction, showing you now stabilization. 
And when we have um, such an assay uh, where you have confirmed that you have the substrate at, at hand here, you can um, very quickly uh, nail down the sequences that are recognized um, by the E3 ligase on the substrate. And in our case, in this FNIP1 uh, degron, uh, in the SNP1 protein, uh, we could uh, nail down the degron to the sequence of about 20 residues. And this will be important for the rest of the talk because we will be studying this degron a lot. When we found it, this was sort of the first moment in this, or the second after the screen, I would assume, moment where we really got happy because I just remind you that we were studying a redox sensing pathway. And there were three residues that were uh, conserved in this uh, degron sequence. And all three of these residues were cysteines. And most importantly, if you mutate these cysteines, we had very strong uh, functional um, effects. So in this case, we have the same fact-based degradation assay where the solid curve is under control conditions and the dashed curve is under conditions where we induce um, the C3 ligase. And so for the wild type, you get this left shift because you degrade the protein. If you mutate two of these residues, um, which, uh, uh, this was these two here, 580 and 582, these two here, you get a pretty strong stabilization. You get a shift of the uh, solid curve to the right and now expression of the ligase doesn't work anymore. And the same is true upon mutation of this cysteine residue. And if you get rid of all of these cysteines, there is no degradation at all. So we have uh, an E3 ligase that is important for redox sensing in, under conditions of reductive stress. And it recognizes a degron sequence in the substrate that is chock full of cysteines. And it clearly needs these cysteines for activity. Um, and so with this, we could actually uh, show that this is a uh, redox sensor and that it can monitor reductive stress. And again, just to remind you, most reactive oxygen species in cells are produced by mitochondria and specifically by complex one and complex three of the electron transport chain. Now, in order to get electron transport, you need redox uh, equivalents, and you get these through the TCA cycle that in the cells that we were studying was fed mostly by glutamine that is imported into mitochondria through glutamate and, and turned into alpha ketoglutarate and then entering the TCA cycle. And so if you deplete glutamine, uh, for example, you shut off the uh, electron transport chain, you have less ROS, you get reductive stress, and as shown here in the red curve, you get a shift to the left telling you that reduction actually induces degradation. The same is seen upon um, our initial stress condition when we depleted KEEP1. You can also do the converse experiment. You can um, feed mitochondria with alpha ketoglutarate to have this TCA cycle run in overdrive. So you have higher activity of the electron transport chain. You produce more reactive oxygen species and that shifts the curve to the right. So there is a redox sensor uh, that is activated by reductive stress and inhibited by oxidative stress. And the consequences of how this are on the cell were also quite, quite striking. Um, namely, we found that, that this math pathway directly regulates mitochondria and hence the uh, source for reactive oxygen species. Now, this, the, the, the most we, we looked at this in, in many different ways. The most striking one was through transmission electron microscopy, where normally in control cells you have these beans. <laughs> with, with, with the cristane between that are uh, characteristic for mitochondria. If you deplete um, the substrate, um, you actually get slightly higher, um, larger mitochondria. And we knew that these substrates, uh, these mitochondria were more active. If we do the reverse, that we depleted the E3 ligase, and so we stabilized the substrate, we got a very striking and very different phenotype. The first thing that we saw was that the mitochondria were pitch black. This was actually a phenotype first described in the 1960s. It's called matrix condensation. And it basically indicates that these mitochondria have run out of substrate for the electron transport chain. And we could confirm this by metabolomics where we saw that um, these cells accumulate outside of mitochondria, the metabolites that should have been imported into mitochondria in the first place. Now, a second phenotype that we saw very frequently were these onion mitochondria. This is hyperproliferation of cristae structure, and this is a response of mitochondria if they cannot perform enough electron transport chain functions. So they just want to make more enzyme, uh, underscoring that again, inhibition of the enzyme shuts down the electron transport chain. And the third phenotype we see are these intermediary structures that are indicative of a beginning mitophagy, which is due to inhibition of the electron transport chain, a consecutive uh, drop in the mitochondrial membrane potential. And what was the most striking of all of this, and me as a trained geneticist loved that experiment the most, was that all of these 
uh, phenotypes here were completely rescued by co-depletion of NIP1, telling us that this substrate that we found is the essential substrate in regulating mitochondrial um, structure and function. So, so this was basically the, the um, beginning of that story where we uh, used a, a, a developmental pathway that was sensitive um, to stress in real life to find new stress responses. And what Andrew discovered was the reductive stress response. And I'll summarize this here in this um, little scheme. So in the normal, in a, heavy, in a healthy cell, the electron transport chain will be active, will produce reactive oxygen species. These reactive oxygen species actually oxidize these cysteine residues that I told you are important in FNP1, and we know they form intramolecular disulfide bonds. When this FNP1 protein is stabilized under normal conditions, it actually um, initi initiates a uh, negative feedback to inhibit uh, the electron transport chain and inhibit mitochondria. I should say that we don't know all that much about how that reaction occurs yet. Now, when um, uh, you encounter, for example, uh, metabolic stress and you don't have enough fuel for the electron transport chain, um, this electron transport chain would be inactive. It wouldn't make ATP, but it would also not make um, reactive oxygen species. And this leads to a reversal of this oxidation event here to create reduced FNP1. And it is this reduced FNP1 that is recognized by this E3 ligase FEM1B, which then induces polyubiquitylation of FNP1 and proteosomal degradation. And now you've um, removed this mitochondrial gatekeeper or inhibitor of mitochondrial function. And by removing it, uh, cells can turn on mitochondria. Um, the electron transport chain will be active and ROS will be produced. And so um, this is the sensory arm of the reductive stress response. And this seems to be the effector arm of the reductive stress response. Now, the key uh, function in this pathway obviously was that you had an E3 ligase that could discriminate between an oxidized protein and a reduced protein. The oxidized protein present in healthy cells should not be recognized, whereas the reduced protein should be selectively degraded. How an enzyme is able to do this, basically how an E3 ligase can distinguish substrates based on redox state, um, but not on sequence, that was not known. But you know, we really needed to understand this in order to um, figure out how reductive stress signaling occurs. And so Elijah with, with Andrew, uh, uh, teamed up and they uh, clipped down the enzyme and the substrate to the minimal domains they needed um, and were able to um, solve a 2.9 angstrom crystal structure of this complex. And this structure had many really cool features and uh, you know I love looking at it. One of them was that the three cysteine residues we found to be important are the three residues that point towards um, the enzyme. Here in orange uh, is the Dacron loop that is inserted into this very deep groove uh, on the substrate shown here in, in bluish or, or purplish like colors. But the key feature of this interface actually was that the interaction was established by means that we had not seen before. So normally, I know many of you do structural biology, you will have looked at protein complexes that form. And in those cases, very often or always, um, an amino acid side chain of one partner binds amino acid side chains of the other partner, or maybe the peptide backbone, but the two proteins are basically in contact with each other. In this case, that's not the case. It's an indirect interaction and it's mediated through two zinc ions that interface between the um, enzyme shown here in blue and um, the substrate shown in orange. So what these two zinc ions do is they act as a molecular glue or as a Velcro to stitch the substrate um, to the enzyme. And we know it's important. It's absolutely essential for binding activity, degradation, and signaling in cells. And I just want to again show you one experiment for this. Um, for the sake of simplicity, I, I tried to do most of it with this one quantitative facts-based essay that I should say, um, uh, in using it, we were uh, really inspired a lot by Ben Ebert's uh, lab, who, who uses this approach also very much to, to, to his success. Um, and this experiment, we again look at degradation of this FNP1 protein. Uh, we can induce the ligase and we see this left shift, which, which induces degradation. And then we can induce the same experiment. We induce the ligase under conditions where we chelate zinc through a, a strong chelator T-pen. And we can see that the ligase now has no function whatsoever. Now, because many of you think about ubiquitous and a lot, you know that this E3 ligase not only has this zinc dependent interface, it also has a zinc sitting in the ring finger um, so we had to like control for this. And so we went directly to Ben's toolbox and we used a, a image uh, dependent degradation event that uses a, a 
uh, a column-based ligase that also relies on RBX1, the ring finger protein, the same that we are dealing. The normal substrate is shown here. In this case, you induce degradation in red here um, by adding the emmet. If you do this with, with the sink chelator, you don't see any difference. This tells you that the ring finger sink is bound very, very tightly, yet the interface sink we see in our structure um, is, is bound uh, less tightly. So this mechanism using sink as a molecular glue actually explains this very important redox sensor in our cells. In um, oxidized cells, when you form these intramolecular disulfide bonds, um, these um, cysteines are not able to coordinate sync. So you re require reduction and the formation of, of reduced cysteines that you can coordinate sync and that you can form this molecular glue dependent interface in order to drive degradation. So for us, this really is a molecular glue. It's not an organic molecule. It's not a big molecule. It's a metal ion, but it really acts as a molecular glue. And for me, Personally, it's really nice to take a step back and now look at molecular glues and protein degradation. So, um, you know, we started Nurex actually in 2008 or 2009, and the only um, <laughs> preliminary data we had at the time was a molecular glue um, that uses, is used to induce protein degradation in plants. That's a hormone called auxin. And this was really beautiful work, first genetically by, by Marcus Dell and then groundbreaking uh, structural work by Ning Cheng. A few years later, um, work that you are all more familiar than I am with um, showed that these glues uh, can work in human cells and can actually have therapeutic value. This was actually the image, beautiful work by Bill and, and Kaelin and Ben Ebert and Phil Chamberlain at Selchin at the time. I should also mention uh, structurally revealed by, by Nico Tome and Eric Fisher showed that you can use small molecule glues to stitch uh, neosubstrates to ligases. We took this a, a step further um, a, a while back with Carl Simonetta, uh, first in my lab and then later at Norex to show that you can choose basically any three ligase to find glues to stitch proteins for their degradation so that you can get prospective glue. And when we kind of um, close the circle by finding that molecular glues are also important for physiological degradation in human cells. And I, I'm pretty sure that this is just the tip of the tip of the tip of the tip of the iceberg. There's most likely many more to be discovered. Now, um, while, while this was really, I think, uh, exciting for us with respect to um, the mechanism of reductive stress signaling, it posed a very, very important question right from the beginning. So I told you that this stress pathway senses reactive oxygen species, and it really does so in order to monitor the electron transport chain. Now it happens that not every cell needs the electron transport chain to produce ATP, and that's especially important for developmental regulation. Stem cells, for example, don't like the ETC because you produce ROS and ROS are dangerous. And if you wanna maintain pluripotency for decades, that doesn't make sense. And so um, there have to be mechanisms to regulate this pathway and adjust it to development. But how you do this by means other than just controlling the reductive state here of NIP1, that was not clear. So it's a very important question, especially with respect to development and disease. Um, lucky for us, our structure gave us um, a little hint. And so in, in this uh, depiction of our structure, we uh, mapped conservation onto the structure. In red, we have highly conserved sequences and blue are less conserved sequences. Here in the middle, you see this very deep groove into which the loop of the substrate inserts. And you see it's very highly conserved. But the strange thing is the substrate doesn't like fill up the whole cleft. Uh, it only fills up about half of it. And in fact, it's the less conserved half that it binds to because you only need to conserve the zinc binding sites. Um, the other half um, of the uh, uh, substrate binding groove, which is very conserved, is occupied by a buffer molecule that we needed to, for crystallization, which was a HEPAS molecule. And what was cool about this was that this HEPAS molecule was um, coordinated through an arginine residue, arginine 126, that when mutated, heterozygously actually, causes a syndromic global developmental delay and many problems in uh, brain development because this arginine doesn't bind the substrate, but it's very close to the substrate, very conserved. And because its mutation causes a developmental phenotype, that suggested that it might be involved in recruiting regulators of reductive stress signaling that would link this pathway to proper and robust development. 
so to see whether that's the case. Um, we, of course, first went to our in vitro system where everything is pure, everything is clean, and we produced both a wild type version of, of Femon B and the mutant version. And we tested binding to the key substrate FNP1. And you can see in vitro, there is practically or absolutely no phenotype whatsoever. So that was a bit disappointing, but we then went into the cells and went back to this degradation assay that by now, I think you know. And so again, this is the FNP1 protein, how uh, stable it is. We uh, can induce our wild type ligase and we see the shift to the left. And when we now induced similar amounts of mutant ligase seen in disease, we had a very different and striking phenotype. And that was that um, the substrate was degraded much better. So this was a gain of function phenotype that is consistent with the heterozygous nature um, of the mutations that you see in disease. And these discrepancies always make me very happy because it tells us immediately that um, in our in vitro system, we have something missing that is present in cells. And that gives you um, a very straightforward approach to discovering new regulators of a pathway. So in this case, we could predict that there is an inhibitor of the reductive stress response that binds through this disease mutated arginine residue. To find that inhibitor, we used um, quantitative proteomic mapping. Um, so our proteomics is kind of amateur compared to what Eric Fisher is doing at, at um, uh, Dana Faber, but is actually good enough for finding um, what the missing regulator was. So we postulated that mutation of this disease uh, relevant residue, arginine 126, should kick off an inhibitor. So if this is the case, this mutant should bind substrates better than wild type. And so in a, in a scatter plot, the substrate should um, appear here on the y-axis. And then, of course, the whole foundation of this was that the inhibitor is not bound by the mutant. And so uh, an inhibitor or more inhibitors, if there are more, should um, be preferentially bound here by the wild type protein. And this actually worked beautifully well. Um, our substrate and its FNP1, its uh, binding partner, it's a constitutive binding partner is right there on the um, y-axis, whereas the top hits on the um, x-axis were five very related proteins called the BEX proteins. They're all encoded on the X chromosome and all next to each other. And they're all very similar and you know, very, very highly homologous. And the first thing that we immediately uh, noticed about these genes, which I had never heard of before, um, was that they are actually very important in stem cells. Not only are they expressed in stem cells, but they are needed to reprogram a fibroblast into a stem cell. And so into a cell, cell type where electron transport chain function is very low. This is actually beautiful work done by Konrad Hoch-Ehlinger over at the Simchus building um, in Boston. But what made us really jump around in happiness when we saw this was, um, you know, when we did, when, when I did my very deep uh, scientific search for, for, for knowledge and I Googled Bex <laughs> and what, what, what do Bex proteins do in Google? And, and the top hit was that mutation of these Bex genes or deletion of these Bex genes uh, actually occurs in a disease um, that is called XQ22 deletion syndrome. And this is a developmental phenotype that is very, very similar to mutation of fem one b So the gain of function mutation in fem one b seem to have the same developmental phenotype as deletion of the BEX genes, which on the one hand tells you most likely these BEX genes, if their effect is direct, should be inhibitors. But it also actually tells you that reductive stress signaling really has to be controlled for development. Without reductive stress signaling, you don't have um, robust development. And so to, to figure out whether they are um, inhibitors, we again did many experiments. Um, I show you this, this uh, recognizable degradation assay again. So this is again, looking at FNP1 degradation, we induce the ligase, you have this characteristic shift to the left. Um, if we now express the ligase together with one of these five uh, BEX proteins, you see that the ligase cannot induce degradation all that well, showing you that this really is a very potent inhibitor of this uh, reductive stress E3 ligase. And most strikingly and most importantly for us, if we induce the disease allele uh, of femon B, not only do we get a sh better shift to the left, uh, it's a hyperactive mutant, um, but this mutant is now also completely resistant to function of these inhibitors, uh, really linking these proteins to re regulation of the reductive stress response. Now we studied their mechanism in, in, in detail and there are many interesting features about this. First, we could like nail down a required binding um, element in, in, Bex, in the Bex proteins is basically their C terminus. They bind uh, the ligase with very high affinity in the, in the low nanomolar range. Um, they need the uh, arginine uh, for binding that was nice, but what is also cool is they actually also need zinc. 
Um, and then if you interfere with both the arginine and zinc, which also most likely acts at the interface between the inhibitor in this case um, and the E3 ligase, you have no binding whatsoever. So they act um, or they bind really in a way that is very similar to how the substrate binds, only with the added benefit of this um, additional arginine. And then when you add those inhibitors to in vitro ubiquitylation reactions, we can in vitro ubiquitylate our FNP1 protein, um, or this is the Dacron. We can fully inhibit this by these BEX proteins. They're really strong inhibitors, but, oops, but um, luckily for us, this disease mutant again is resistant and you still have um, ubiquitylation of FNP1. But at the same time, even though they bind like a substrate, they don't behave like a substrate. The BEX proteins themselves are actually not ubiquitylated by FEM1B. And because of this, we call them pseudo-substrate inhibitors of this E3 ligase. So putting all of this together, I think we now had um, um, a, a system that monitors the activity of the electron transport chain through the production of reactive oxygen species. If the ETC is on, um, cysteine residues and FNP1 are oxidized, that stabilizes the protein. If the electron transport chain and mitochondria are inactive, you, get, you run out of reactive oxygen species, that's reductive stress. You reduce the cysteine residues, you can form this uh, molecular glue dependent interface with the E3 ligase. And during development, you basically set a threshold for this reaction by expressing BEX proteins. These are expressed in stem cells when you don't want to have a lot of this signaling happening. And they basically block the substrate binding site um, in a way that is very reminiscent to substrates, but without getting ubiquitinated. So um, what this actually also shows you is that if you um, misregulate this pathway, either through mutation of uh, FEM1B here in this arginine that doesn't bind BEX proteins or by deleting BEX proteins, you should get premature activation of the re, uh, electron transport chain, and that should lead to a deleterious accumulation of reactive oxygen species or actually oxidative stress. And this turns out to be the case. We can test this both by either um, expressing stably the disease allele of FEM1B or by depleting all BEX proteins. And I just show you the data for the FEM1B mutant, if you express it, you get premature degradation of the substrate. This gives you a very strong increase in um, the electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation, which we measure here by oxygen consumption. This leads to a very strong increase in the production of reactive oxygen species or um, oxidative stress. And this actually has a really nice um, inhibitory um, effect on cell proliferation, just as you would expect for a developmental phenotype. So, um, what this really shows us not only is um, that, that the reductive stress response is important for development, but that hyperactivation of this pathway causes disease. And if you have something like this, many of you are interested in targeting the ubiquitin system and immediately raise the possibility that we could help those patients of this disease by developing FEM1B inhibitors. Now, we all know that E3 ligases are difficult to target. But with our structures in hand, we felt a little bit more confident. And so we actually used two approaches to see whether we can target this enzyme with small molecules. So the first uh, we did, um, Andrew teamed up again in a very close uh, collaboration with, with Nate Henning, who's a grad student in, in my good friend, Dan Amura's lab at, at Berkeley. And uh, they found using Dan's covalent inhibitor um, approach that you can target actually the cysteine residue in FEM1B that's used to chelate zinc. And that inhibits uh, FEM1B in vitro as well as in vivo shown here by the right shift um, in this, in this um, degradation assay. With this in hand, we got a little bit more bold and we did a full uh, blown um, drug discovery um, approach together with uh, Julia Shaletsky who's running our drug discovery center in Berkeley and found now highly potent um, non-covalent inhibitors of this machinery. And what is really cool and exciting is that the strength of stabilization correlates exactly with how much you shut off the electron transfer chain. So directly what you would have to counteract in disease. Um, our best um, non-covalent inhibitors now have a very potent effect in inhibiting um, ROS production by the mitochondrial um, electron transfer chain. So there is um, uh, you know, something that we can do for these patients uh, with having uh, these inhibitors. Now, I wouldn't be allowed to talk in an induced degradation uh, seminar, I assume, without showing you that this has more applications. Um, we could uh, actually use even our fairly low affinity covalent um, uh, E3 ligase binders to induce protein degradation. There we follow the footsteps of Jay Bradner, who was you know, at your place before he left, uh, and hooked it up to JQ1, and we can see 
um, that that femon B can induce um, BRD4 degradation. Now BRD4 is probably degraded when you look at it, but we can uh, make functional degraders also by by hooking uh, these femon B recruiters now up to other small molecules. So this is going to be a promising, I think, handle for induced degradation uh, in the long term. I think though that the biggest um, uh, uh, and most important um, function of these inhibitors will be in, as inhibitors, because we can not only rescue, um, hopefully, phenotypes that we see in these developmental diseases that I've told you, but I also told you that we found this response because we could counteract the phenotypes of KEEP1 inhibition. And KEEP1 inhibition is actually seen in many cancers. It drives about 40% of our lung adenocarcinomas, but it's all in, also inhibited um, sort of as an invasion strategy for chemotherapy because NERF2 is not only an antioxidant, but also an anti-electrophile um, inducing agent and can counteract um, the function of chemotherapeutics in cells. And so we believe that these cancers will be very sensitive to inhibition um, of femon B using our compounds. And uh, there are also some cancers um, that actually depend quite a bit on mitochondria for survival in this um, uh, is, is particularly uh, prevalent for certain types of, of leukemia. And we would assume because we actually, with our compounds, shut off mitochondria, um, we, we might uh, have a very nice and important tool for treating those diseases as well. So to summarize, I hope that I could convince you that development is a really nice playground to discover um, stress responses. We are really having the time of our lives right now. And um, I just showed you the, the one example here in depth, the reductive stress response, which I find intriguing on many levels. It is a, a pathway that monitors production of reactive oxygen species by the mitochondrial electron transport chain. Um, it depends on the formation of a molecular glue dependent interface, an indirect interface that is very redox sensitive between uh, the three ligase femon B and FNP1. And it is gated by the pseudo substrate inhibitors of the Bax family during development so that you really fine tune mitochondrial activity with developmental programs. And if you have mutations here, clearly you have developmental phenotypes, but inducing degradation of this FNP1 protein um, actually leads through means that we still don't fully understand to activation of the electron transport chain and more producing ROS. Of course, there is you know, a slightly important second product that comes out of this, and this is ATP. And so we believe that this is actually a pathway that monitors the rate of ATP production in cells. And that would obviously be kind of interesting. Um, we're not 100% there yet, but, but that's something that we're investigating in great depth um, these days. And so the reductive stress response depends on a ligase of the Cullen family, uh, reversible oxidation of cysteine residues, in this case in a substrate, and then it degrades a protein that when degraded really alleviates the stress condition. In this case, it turns on the machinery that it produces the reactive oxygen species that we're missing in the first place. It's actually very similar, <coughs> excuse me, in its, in its architecture to the oxidative stress response where you also have a Cullen based ligase that um, uh, is regulated by oxidation and then counteracts uh, the core in this case through of, of the pro problem through, through um, uh, antioxidant signaling. And it's also very similar to um, the, the stress response, the hypoxic stress response discovered by Bill Kalin here, Dana Faber, uh, that depends on, on substrate oxidation, coloring ligase, and then um, the, the modulation of a protein that counteracts the stress. So we're excited about this. There are many, many, many questions that we have uh, to address. I told you some. Uh, in my talk, but others that we're addressing right now is that we know want to know how this reductive stress signaling pathway is integrated into sort of cellular pathways. We do a lot of genetic modifier and genetic interaction screens to find crosstalk with metabolism. We want to study this in a more physiological context. We have knockouts now of this pathway, and we are currently making knock-ins of our disease mutants, and we already have super interesting phenotypes. And we are very, very strongly pushing of actually uh, getting our compounds out for uh, hit to lead development and actually uh, trying to push them ahead for drug discovery. So with this, um, I want to thank you again very, very much for uh, the invitation, for your patience with me in this talk. Um, I want to highlight that the reductive stress response is the brainchild of a brilliant scientist, Andrew Manford, and I just am lucky enough that I'm allowed to talk about this. Um, he got help from many people, but uh, that I think speaks very highly of him that he was able to mentor them and guide them and motivate them throughout this course. So with this, um, Thank you very, very much. And if you have any questions, I would be more than happy to take them. Thank you.